Hello, and welcome to this lesson on handling HTTP requests in Svelte. In this video, we'll learn how to handle HTTP requests like GET and POST using the JavaScript Fetch API. The Fetch API is the modern way to handle HTTP requests in JavaScript. It has a more powerful and flexible feature set than the older XML system. The API uses the Fetch method, which takes two arguments. The first is the path of the resource we want to fetch, and the second is an object with request properties. For the request options, we'll typically only really care about the method, headers, and body options. Method is a string with the type of request we want to send, like get or post. Headers allows us to specify the type of content we're working with, like XML or JSON. And body contains the data we want to process. Fetch returns a promise with a response object, so we can chain then and catch blocks to it. The focus of this lesson is how to use the Fetch API with Svelte. We don't want to worry about setting up and configuring a backend storage solution. So, for our API endpoint, we will be using JSON Placeholder. JSON Placeholder is a free REST API with fake data. Think of it as a fake backend storage solution that we can use for learning or testing. All right, let's get started with the easiest HTTP request we can send. A GET request. When we want to get data with fetch, we only need to specify the resource URL. We don't need the request options because an existing resource already has its data and data type defined. If we go to the JSON placeholder website and scroll down to resources, we can see the routes we're allowed to access. We want to retrieve the content of all the posts, so we can copy this URL. We'll switch over to the editor, and in the root app component, we'll write, fetch, then paste the URL. Then, we get back a response object. But it's just the HTTP response, not the actual JSON content. We'll need to extract the content ourselves. The response object implements the body interface that contains the JSON method. This method can be used to extract JSON content. Once the method parses the content, it will return a promise with the data as an object. From there, we can use the data in whatever way we want. Let's log it to the console for now. If we go to the browser and open up the console in the dev tools, we'll see 100 article objects. So, we successfully fetched the data from the API. Logging it to the console isn't very useful though, so let's store the object in a local array and create a loop to output them in the markup. Above the fetch method, we'll create an array called posts. Then, instead of logging the data to the console, we'll assign it to the array. We'll create an each block, posts, as post and we'll key it with the post ID. Then we'll create an H3 with the post dot title. Then a paragraph for the post dot body. And then just a horizontal line to visually separate each post. If we save and go back to the browser, we'll see all the posts. Sometimes, data from a server can take a while to fetch. This could happen for many reasons, like a slow internet connection, slow server, a large dataset, etc. We should keep the user experience in mind and show them in some way that the data is still loading. To do that, we could use a simple loading message, an animated loading spinner, or ghost elements. In Svelte, there are two ways for us to handle a loading state. We can either add an else block to an each loop. Or, we can use an await then block. As mentioned, Svelte allows us to use an else block inside an each loop. It works the same as the one in the if block, but in this case, it will only render until the data we fetch is ready to be displayed. To demonstrate, let's go back to the editor and add an else condition to our loop. So, curly braces, colon, else, and we'll have a heading that says, loading. Because we're working on the local host, the loading may be too fast to see the message. So, let's open the DevTools and go to the Network tab. 
From there, we'll click on this throttling drop-down and select Fast 3G. If we refresh the page, we can see the loading message for a second. If it's still too fast on your end, you can select the Slow 3G option. Svelte also provides us with the Await Then block to handle promises directly in the markup. We can use this block to handle the loading state. The Await block takes the promise we want to handle and expects the code we want to execute in its body. The then block takes the returned response and expects the code we want to execute when the promise has been resolved. For our demonstration, we'll move the logic into a function, then use the await then block to handle the loading state. First, we'll define the function, so function get posts. Then we select the entire fetch statement and move them into the function body. And because it's in a function now, we have to return the response. Next, we'll go to the markup and remove the else block from earlier, we don't need it anymore. Then we go above the loop and say, curly braces, hash, await. We're awaiting the response from get posts. Until we get that response, we show a heading with loading text. Then the resulting data. So, posts. We want to loop through the data and show each one, so we'll just move our loop up here. And finally, we'll close the await block with slash await. If we save and switch to the browser, we'll see the loading message for a few seconds before the posts are retrieved. But, we actually have some unnecessary code. At the moment, we're taking the response and assigning the data to the posts array, then returning it. Svelte can handle that part for us. If we comment out this line and just return the response, Svelte will automatically assign it to a temporary array called posts down in the then block. And because it's its own array, we can also comment out our array definition. If we save and go back to the browser, we'll see that everything still works. When we send data, we need to specify at least three additional options in the fetch method as a second argument. The first is the request method to tell fetch that we want to send a post request. The second is the headers, and the only required header here is the content type where we specify the type of data we're sending. The last option is the body, with the data we want to send. For our demonstration, we'll send some predefined data to the API by clicking on a button. Let's start by clearing out the get request example. Then, we'll define an object called post data with a user ID of 1. Then, a title called hello world. And a body with lorem ipsum. We have those three because that's what JSON placeholder needs if we want to post data to it. Next, we'll define a function called submit post, which is where we'll create the fetch request in a second. First though, let's add a button in the markup. On click of the button, submit post. All right, let's go back to the function and create the fetch request. JSON placeholder allows us to use the same resource path that we used with the get request. So we can add it as the first argument. As the second argument, we'll add the request object. We'll start with the method, which in this case is post. Then we'll add the headers object with content dash type. We're working with JSON data, so the content type is application forward slash JSON. After the headers object, we have the body object. And all we need to do is assign our data to the correct entry in the JSON placeholder file. So, user ID will receive its value from post data dot user ID. Title from post data dot title. And body from post data dot body. But, as it stands, this won't work. The problem is that the data in our body option is a JavaScript object. They look the same, but JSON object literals aren't the same as JavaScript objects. A JSON object literal can't be an object because JSON is a string format. So, we'll need to convert our JavaScript object into a JSON object with the json.stringify method. 
All we need to do is specify the object we want to convert as an argument to the method. So, we'll say json.stringify and open the parameter list. Then, we go to after the object and close the parameter list again. Alright, the last thing we need to do is to check the response. This is just to help with the demonstration, but we'll add a then block, get the response, and extract the JSON content. Then, we'll take the data and log it to the console. We'll go to the browser and open the console, then click on the submit button. And there we go, the object with our data was added successfully. We know, because we can see the post ID is 101, and by default, JSON placeholder only has 100 posts. If we click the button again, we'll see another post, also with an ID, of 101. That's because JSON placeholder only fakes adding the data. In a real database, the data would be added as post 102. Updating data with fetch works almost the same as sending it. We need a resource path, as well as at least the method, headers, and body request options. We have two options when it comes to updates. We can put update when we want to update all items in our data. And we can patch update when we want to update only specific parts of the data. As mentioned, we use the put request when we want to update all the items in our data. For example, if we want to update all the keys in our posts object. In essence, what we're doing is replacing the entire data entry with new values. For our example, we'll update the first post in the list with new values. We'll start by changing the request method from post to put. Then we'll go up to the post data object and add the post ID of 1. And that also means we have to set it in the request body as well. So, id post data dot id. Finally, we'll add a 1 to the end of the JSON placeholder path. This is to indicate that we want to modify the first post. It doesn't have anything to do with the request itself, it's just how JSON placeholder's API is set up. If we go to the browser and click on the button, we'll see an object with the data we just updated in the console. So, the put update worked as we expected. It's important to note that we have to specify values for all the keys in the JSON object when we're using put. If we omit a key, that key's value will automatically have a null value assigned to it. If we only want to update one or a few pieces of data in an entry, we can use patch as the request method. For example, if we only want to update the title of the blog post. For our demonstration, we'll patch the title of the first blog post. We start by changing the request method from put to patch. Then, we'll remove the ID, user ID, and body from our post data object, as well as from the request body. If we go to the browser and click on the button, we'll see that only the title changed. The other post content, like the body, will still have its original value. So, the patch update works as we expect. A question that often comes up is when to use put and when to use patch. In short, when you're updating all the values in a resource, use put. But, if you only want to update a few values, use patch. For example, we can use patch if we only need to update the title of a blog post. But, if there are changes in the post ID, user ID, and the body, we can use put because the entire resource needs to be updated. If you want more information on the technical differences between the two, you can follow the link in the description below. The lesson is for the Vue framework, but the concepts apply to anything that uses the Fetch API. To delete data, all we have to do is specify the delete request method on the resource path we want to delete. For our demonstration, we'll delete post1 from JSON placeholder. We'll start by changing the request method from patch to delete. Then, we'll remove the headers and body options. And because we don't use any of the post data anymore, we'll remove that as well. If we go to the browser and click on the button, we'll see an empty object in the console. This indicates that the post was successfully deleted. 
It should be noted though, that JSON placeholder only mimics the delete request. If we attempt to get the post again, it will still exist. On a real server, the data will be deleted. Alright, that concludes this lesson on handling HTTP requests in Svelte. In the next video, we'll learn how to store and access data locally in JSON files. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again in the next one.